Okay, uh, it looks like we are live. Okay, all right, so um, thank you everyone for joining us for this workshop um, on pronunciation tips. And um, we have Nicole Kapp with us. And Nicole and I have known each other for several Oh, hold on, I can hear the live going on in the background. Um, <laughs> Nicole, can you um, un, un, um, stop sharing? Unshare for a second. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. I want to not be able to hear the live going on in the background. Okay, there we go. I'm just going to assume it's still going on live. I see that I it is. Hear it, I'm like, it, ah. it shows on my screen. Meeting is now yeah. streaming live on YouTube. So, yeah, I just can't hear it and, and talk at the same time. So yes, as I was saying, Nicole and I have known each other for several years. We met while she was an English language fellow in China, and I was the um, Southern China coordinator of English language fellows. So um, we uh, have known each other uh, for a long time. She's been doing a lot of great things, especially with um, accent reduction and pronunciation and working with a lot of um, students on their pronunciation as well as teachers on how to teach pronunciation. So we're, I'm really excited that she agreed to be with us today and give you these tips. All right. So Nicole, enjoy. All right. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, Gina. Thanks. I'm going to, begin to share my screen right now and I'll tell you a little right. bit about myself in just a moment. All right. Hey. So the title of the presentation today is Teaching Pronunciation, What to Teach and How to Make it Effective and Engaging. And I am Nicole Kalp, and I'm an English language and communication coach. At this point, I am self-employed. I work with companies and with individuals who would like to improve their pronunciation. And basically, I'm specializing in everything related to oral English skills. And that includes improving pronunciation, teaching pronunciation, speaking with an American accent, developing fluency and vocabulary, meeting skills, presentation skills, interview skills, everything related to speaking English in a more effective way to reach your goals. I predominantly work with people that need English for their workplace that are looking to maybe move into higher roles, be more visible, where become leaders actually and get promoted so i work with a lot of tech people i work with some people in healthcare business people occasionally with the university students english teachers so all kinds of different people i've been teaching english is a as a second language to adults since the year 2000 and i've really taught people from a lot of places from I want to say everywhere in the world but I'm sure there's still some countries that we haven't uh, you know met but um, from everywhere um, I do private coaching online courses corporate training all kinds of stuff I have a YouTube channel which I have about 130 videos on that I'll share the link for that at the end so you can go ahead and take a look and hopefully find some videos that can help you with your pronunciation and you can also feel free to share them with your students and even use them in your classrooms. And I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. And I currently live in Seattle. Seattle is in the United States. And it is on the northwest coast up by close to the border of Canada. So usually people are more familiar with Los Angeles or New York or even Florida. And they're like, Seattle, where's that? <laughs> So if you can kind of visualize the United States, the West Coast on the Pacific Ocean, but at the very, very top up there near Canada. I grew up in Southern California, so I have a very standard American accent. Um, okay, we'll leave it at that. So today's agenda, uh, we're first we're gonna talk a little bit about the theory related to teaching pronunciation. So what's important in English pronunciation and how do we teach it to our students. I'm also going to give you an explanation of the different areas that are important in teaching because a lot of times people assume well okay I'm going to teach people how I'm going to teach my students to say the th sound or the r sound but there is really far more to teaching pronunciation than just the individual sounds so we're going to be focusing more on the rest of pronunciation that you 
may not have heard about before. And I'll, throughout the explanation, I'll give you illustrations of techniques and activities that you can use for teaching pronunciation in an effective and an engaging way. All right. So at the end of this training, you guys will, you guys, the teachers, will be familiar with what pronunciation concepts should be taught. You'll understand and use those concepts, hopefully, in your English. And then you'll have fun and engaging activities for, for practicing yourself or that you can use with your students. So we have kind of two main goals here. It's for you as non-native speakers to be um, thinking about your own English pronunciation and you know noticing if there are things that you'd like to improve, but also knowing how to guide your students in improving their pronunciation. Okay, I have a lot of material, so Hopefully I'm not going too fast. I'll try to slow down. And if you guys have questions, there's only three of you. So um, I'll stop periodically and ask for questions or feel free to write something in the chat. And Gina, you can notify me if there's a question and I need to stop. And um, yeah, and then we'll just have you, well, in this case, it sounds like unmuting is probably not the best idea, but maybe just writing in the chat. Okay, we're going to talk about theory. I know theory is not very exciting, but uh, I tried to keep it a bit short and give you just the, the highlights of what's really important here. Okay, so learning theory. You, if you're in education and language learning education, you've probably heard that children under the age of about 12 generally will pick up languages on their own. They don't need that explicit pronunciation instruction so much. They just need to be exposed to the language. They need to have a lot of age appropriate, authentic language coming in. And that could be, you know, songs and rhymes and reading books and watching videos at their age. So children under 12, if you're dealing with young youngsters, you just need to be bringing in authentic language for them to be immersed in. You want to make the learning fun, keeping effective filters low. So again, if you're in education, you're aware of the effective filter theory. Basically, um, the effective filter will either let uh, learning in or keep it out. So we want to make sure the, that filter is low, people are relaxed, they're having fun, they're being entertained, they're not feeling stressed. Okay. So the learner doesn't even realize that he or she is learning. And this goes both for, for children, but also for adults. You want to make sure the adults are, are engaged and doing something relevant and kind of enjoying themselves. And that way they're going to learn better. Okay. So when you have adults and children, teenagers that need pronunciation instruction, first they're going to need awareness. They're not, their ears are not tuned in to hear all the sounds of different languages and notice the patterns. At this point, once you reach your teen years, you generally have a filter, a language filter, which your native language is kind of coloring what you hear. So you're not necessarily going to detect things that are different in the new language in English. So in addition, your older children and adults will need access to native authentic speech as well and opportunities for meaningful communication. Or well, I think in, in the past, a lot of times education has failed, language education specifically has failed because it's not been relevant to the learner. They're learning lists of words and they're learning grammatical structures, but they're not really integrating, or this, this has been in the past. I think textbooks and learning materials have gotten much better in the last couple of decades about trying to relate the learning to the learner's life, actually making it relevant and interesting and not just giving them lists of words and grammatical structures without relevant communication. And I see there are some questions here before I kind of move on to the next. Um, Gina, can you look at the, the questions for me there? Um, yes, okay. Um, we have the it's um it's actually John and um Dr. Singh saying hello to each other. <laughs> oh, hi guys. <laughs> no question yet. <laughs> oh, I just see keep seeing it flash and if yeah. I go and look at that it kind of interferes with my PowerPoint and then I get stuck and have to unshare so it's just yeah. easier if you look for me. Okay. 
All right. Yes. Well, I, I thought, okay. I just, I, I didn't see the flash myself. Yeah. Okay. okay. I was just thinking, oh, I must have said something because all of a sudden everybody's like chiming in here on theory. Okay. Okay. So, um, so for your adults and older children, you're, wanting, you're going to want to awaken other areas of the brain, not just a language area of the brain. That specific area, Broca's area, is really not so flexible after, uh, after puberty. It really just kind of gets set and it's um, kind of wired for your, your native language. So we need to actually tap into other parts of the brain. And I'm going to show you a little video next that's, that, that's kind of interesting and talks about that. So brain science. We want to activate the parts of the brain that are still open to learning new language sounds. So images, music, movement in other ways. So if you're an educator, you've definitely heard these terms. Kinesthetic. You want to get movement involved in gesturing, using hands and, and getting movement involved in the learning. Um, auditory. We want to tap into rhythm and musicality. So we want to open up the musical areas of, of the brain. And visual cues are often important in pronunciation. Not so much reading the words on the screen here, but using colors to, um, to indicate certain sounds and using notes and little markings. And I'm going to show you examples of both of those in a little while. So you don't have to guess what a markup is. I will actually show you an example in, in a bit here. So here, oh, not at my video yet almost. Um, so we've come to the realization that we cannot teach speech elements in isolation. So in the past, we've wanted to say, we're just going to focus on a specific sound, TH sound, R sound, V sound, whatever it is, or we're just going to focus on word stress, or we're just going to focus on linking. So more recently in this last decade, we've been realizing we can't focus on one or the other. Because for a while, we started thinking about suprasegmentals, which actually suprasegmentals are your rhythm and melody, your intonation, the overall sound of the language. We started to think that that was the key for a while and started to exclusively focus on that. And then realized that, well, we've got the sounds that we just can't ignore those. They are part of the language too. So these are two key terms in here, suprasegmentals, and then segmentals refer to the segments, right? The individual sounds. So we don't wanna look at either of those in isolation. And we don't really even wanna look at individual words or sentences, but the language as a whole as well. So we're getting more to the big picture and away from, well, I wouldn't say away from the details, but the details are there and we need to look at them, but we also need to see the big picture. All right. I seem to have lost the little video I was going to show you guys. Hold on one second. Um, oops, I stopped sharing, didn't I? One second. Let me go back into that. I'm trying to figure out where my video went that I was going to show you. Oh, no, it's upcoming. Okay. I thought I lost it. Technical difficulties, that's what I'm calling it. <laughs> okay. Let me go back and share again. This is live, so right, we're not even going to edit out all the, all the mistakes. All right, so let's start talking about suprasegmentals, right? Your rhythm, your melody, your overall sound of English. Okay, so some of the different elements of suprasegmentals, some of the different kind of concepts that are included in this idea of suprasegmentals are word stress, sentence stress, grouping words and pausing, Linking words, using contractions, reductions for that kind of overall flu fluent, smooth speech. And pitch. And there are some others as well, such as like vocal quality, speed, volume, that sort of thing. And when you're more aware of these elements, especially how we link words together and how we use contractions and reductions, removing sounds, it helps you understand the language better. 
you start realizing native speakers are actually removing sounds and we're blending words together. And that's really hard for students who have learned English through reading and writing. They don't recognize how we've removed sounds. They're expecting to hear all the sounds they see in writing and spoken English is quite different. So this definitely helps in understanding once you have an awareness of how all of this works. So let's talk about stress first. So if you look at these two words, the question is, are they pronounced the same or different? Hmm. What do you think? Same or different? Are you, are you asking Dr. Singh and Don? They, they could answer. Yes, they could. Yeah. If they are there. I think. You pronounce these the same or different? Slightly different. Different. Yeah. Different? different. Yeah. Okay. All right. So they are different, very different. So this really is, illustrates the importance of word stress. You need to make sure that you know which part of that word is going to be said louder and longer. So the first one, desert. You definitely hear the first part, the DE, much louder, longer. The pitch goes up on that. It just stands out prominently. And the second word, dessert, the same thing is happening, but I'm emphasizing the second part of that word, dessert. And if you put the stress on the other one, you cause confusion for your listener there. In this case, you're changing the meaning. In other cases, it likely just makes the word unintelligible. I just won't catch what you're saying. And that's the most likely situation. I just don't quite get what you're saying and look at you blankly. So here's an example. This word. It has three syllables. A, pin, yen. Three, opinion. We'll talk about syllab syllables in a minute and how to know what a syllable is. But do you pronounce it with the stress on, look at the red part. The, the red part in in each of these three represents the stress. Do you say it like number one, opinion? Do you say it like number two, opinion? Or like number three, opinion? Maybe you guys can put it in the chat. Exactly. The chat. Write a, a, a one or a two or a three. Perfect. I usually get different answers depending upon the language, the native language of the person. Um, okay, so we have, um, Dr. Singh says one, opinion. Okay. John, what do you think? Mm, I'm not seeing John's. I know, answer. native language, your native language will automatically um, kind of color your response to this. John being a native Spanish speaker is going to say number two. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of, I'm assuming. So okay. it, actually, so in this case, he has kind of, um, um, I guess a benefit of having the same stress pattern for this word as our English, but there are many words that differ in stress pattern from Spanish to English. So it's actually opinion is what a, an American speaker would say opinion. And occasionally we do have some difference between what British would say and Americans would say. And that tends to be a lot on words that come from French where British and American tend to differ a lot. All right, opinion. Stress the wrong syllable and we, we probably just don't understand the word. And uh, Gina and I were talking last time. I was, um, I think we both had experiences with a student where they f put the stress on something and we just went. The last time I was talking to a student of mine and a lot of times I start out with free speech when I talk to students and I just make notes of the things I'm hearing. And he was talking and he, and he, was, he lives here in the US and he was saying, yeah, I'm really looking forward to when the vaccine's out because then life will get back to normal. And I was thinking and I was like, hmm, right? I just was like, and then I went, oh, I know what he said, right? It was kind of the context of what we were talking about made me realize what he, what he meant. But if it were 
kind of out of context, I never would have guessed what it was, right? And the word was vaccine, right? V-A-C-C-I-N-E. And he said vaccine. So well, actually he said waxin with like a W pronunciation instead of a V. So um, yeah, this, this is, I would say of all the different things that you can look at regarding pronunciation, word stress is, I would say the number one most important thing to get right in order to have intelligible speech. It's not the only thing, but I would put it as probably number one priority. So if you are teaching your students new vocabulary, new words, it's really important that they make a note of where the stress is on those new words they're learning. And they should actually, if they're going to keep a vocabulary journal, notebook, or something else, they really should be writing in somehow the stress, either highlighting it, underlining it, doing something so that they're noting where that primary stress is. That's how important this is. Okay, I see a question. Or just a vote? I was, I was just me, I was just writing oh. back to you. Vaccine okay. Ah, thing. gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so here we need to look at syllables. What's key to understanding word stress is being able to distinguish syllables. Can you hear syllables in English? And the syllables, well, they're like the little chunks of word. But what's? Excuse. Me. Oh, sure. Excuse me. Uh, which one was the correct of the opinion? Oh, opinion. opinion. Go back really quick. It's number two here, opinion. Okay, that is the correct one. Yeah, and I know Indian English really does have some variation. Um, and actually, I think I've heard Indian speakers use maybe all three of those as well. So I know there's quite a bit of difference in, in Indian English about kind of what's understood amongst Indians. Um, yeah, but in the U.S., the number two option is 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 what's right. In in Australian English, I'm assuming is also opinion. Yeah, I think pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So going back to syllables. So at the heart at the heart of every syllable in a word is a vowel sound. And so your vowels, well, vowels are spelled with the letters a, e, i, o, u, sometimes y but they can be spelled with combinations of them as well, A, I, O, U. So those are your vowels, right? Your, ba your basic five vowels there. And really we have more like 14, 15 sounds in American English represented by only five vowel letters. Well, that's really another topic actually, but so at the heart of each of your syllables is a vowel sound. So you'll notice af, ter, noon, you hear a, you hear the vowel a, ah, so there's one. You hear er. Believe it or not, anything ending in an r, well, e r a r o r is considered a vowel. So, a, ah, er, and oo. So you hear three distinct vowel sounds. So you have three syllables in this word. Afternoon. Right. Yesterday. We have a eh and yes, er and ter an A at the end. Now you're not looking at the vowel letters, you're listening for the sounds. E, er, and A. Because you see the A, Y together, but they're one, they're one vowel. They're the, the A sound, okay? So you have three different vowel sounds. So you've got three syllables in this one. This one's a bit longer. E, right, technology. Te, E, A. Technol, uh, yeah. A, 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 and E. You got four. Technology. Okay, so that's the basis. We need to be able to determine how many syllables are in a word first before we can determine which of those parts are going to have the primary stress. So same word, afternoon. Let me go back to this one. Do you hear your stress on af? Ter or noon. So basically one, two, or three. Af, af would be one. Ter is two. Noon is three. Afternoon. What do you think? Stress is on first, second, or third syllable. Afternoon. 
Can you guys put it in the chat again? If it's a one, two, or three with afternoon. Gina's not voting. <laughs> she, I didn't she, vote. No, she's got a, she's got a, uh, what would you call Unfair it? Fair advantage. A, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Afternoon. I'm going to make it John, more obvious. Afternoon. John and Dr. Singh, can you please put it in the chat? <laughs> if you think it's on the first, oh, second, or third go. syllable. We yeah, got somebody. There we go. Okay. Dr. Singh says three. Good. Okay. So. I don't know what's going on with John. John, are you still with us? <laughs> but having a break. Dr. Singh, good job. You got it right. <laughs> nice work. Afternoon. Okay. So on that third syllable on noon. So you'll notice that one is loudest. It's longest. It has a, a pitch jump. Afternoon. Afternoon. It kind of jumps up there. Okay. So this is referred to as primary stress. If you look at a dictionary, an online dictionary, you're going to see a little mark generally um, above and just before noon to show that that is the stress syllable. Yesterday, again, stress on yes, ter, or day. One, two, three. Yes, ter, day. If we were in a classroom, I would have you guys hold up fingers. But actually, I modified this presentation today for online purposes only, since I think very few people are actually teaching in physical classrooms these days. So I removed the activities that were related to physical classroom things and substituted in activities that can easily be done online. So usually when I have like physical groups of people, I have them vote, like especially voting right before their face. So not everybody in the classroom can see the answer. So if they're voting like this, only I can really see what they're voting. Because if somebody's doing this, right, they've got their finger up in the air, once one person sees that, they just copy what they see. <laughs> okay, so yesterday, your stress is on the first syllable in this case. And then okay. this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, now you tell us, Dr. Singh. <laughs> See, this is what happens. Once, once I voted one, everybody else voted one because they think I'm the smartest person in the class because I was the first to vote. And so they just all copy. So I love this voting like right here, like kind of like your personal voting. <laughs> okay, so so Dr. Singh and John, tell us um, what what it is for the next word for technology. Can you exactly. Put it in the chat? You, actually, you just heard Gina say it in context in a whole sentence, which is a little bit trickier than saying it as a single word and trying to hear, because when I say it in the classroom, I obviously exaggerate and overpronounce it. But Gina said it just in the regular sentence as a normal speaker would say it. So. Yeah. And um, Dr. Singh has, has put a number one in the chat. Okay, so you think the word technology stresses the first syllable. Is that correct? Technology stresses the first syllable. Okay. John, are you with us, John? <laughs> John, if you're with us, just chime in any old time. Chime in means to speak up, say, you know, talk to us. Okay, so technology. Technology, as we're practicing in the classroom, we're generally emphasizing this. So it's really, really obvious on her technology, technology, because in at the sentence level or, or, or longer, it's subtle. The, the difference is definitely there, but it's not so easy to detect if your ear is not uh, used to hearing it. So technology, technology. Okay, so in terms of illustrating syllable stress, we can use different things. We can use hand gestures, and I have a little video on the hand gestures in a moment I'm gonna show you on how to illustrate this to your students, or even with yourself. You can also use clapping, we can tap on the table, rubber bands, humming, different things. But let me show you this little video here. Let's see if it will open up. It's just a minute and a half. And it goes through um, a specific technique using your hand to get your body involved in the pronunciation. So kinesthetics.
Okay, I don't think it wants, to, I'm gonna to have to unshare, I think. I don't think it wants to go in there since we're, oh, maybe because we're live. So. If there's any problem with the sound or image or anything, just stop me and let me know. I think it should be fine. Make sure you click share sound. I did. That's why I was yeah. thinking. I was like, I always forget yeah, that. you always forget that and have to redo it. Yeah. Hi, this is Karen here for a color vowel minute. We already know that listen and repeat isn't an effective strategy for improving pronunciation. If it were, we'd all be able to speak foreign languages. The color vowel system is here to help, but it's not just something you see, it's something you do. The open hand is a physical cue that trains your brain to succeed with stress. I'll show you how it works and you follow after me. Green tea speak. Green tea speak. Blue moon improve. Blue moon improve. Gray day pronunciation. Gray day pronunciation. Purple shirt university. Purple shirt university. Lengthening your arm like this measures the time you need to spend on the stressed syllable. Without the open hand, you're probably spending too little time on the stressed syllable, and this is when misunderstanding occurs. By opening your hand and lengthening your arm, your voice follows a physical cue that allows you to follow the rhythm of English instead of defaulting to the automatic patterns of your first language. With the open hand, you're training your brain to speak with the expected rhythm of English. This creates listener confidence, which in turn boosts your confidence. So use the open hand. Thanks for joining me for a Color Vowel Minute. Okay. Okay. And so that's a gesture. That was an example of a gesture. So that's one that you can use. There are other gestures as well. But that's one example. Um, a lot of times I use like a rising gesture too, especially if I'm talking about pitch and pitch meaning, let's say I'm asking you a question. Um, did you, did you, did you have lunch today? Did you have, um, did you already have lunch? Notice how I'm going up. Did you already have lunch? Lunch? And so I'll be using like gesturing in a different way. She uses it here to do stress, but I can also use it for like pitch and for other things. And I do actually use my hands a lot to kind of emphasize length, but, uh, oh, here it is. Okay, rubber bands have been used for quite quite a while, a few decades now, um, to illustrate stress as well. So it kind of just gives you that idea of the length, the stretching. So technology, afternoon. As you're doing that, you're you're holding it as long as it takes your mouth and your brain to actually say that. Technology pronunciation. And so having some sort of physical movement really does open up the brain in a different way that maybe your language area of your brain is just not getting that. It actually needs a gesture to go along. You can do clapping. I've done clapping before. Let's see. Pronunciation. Um, this kind of, I'm not a very kinesthetic person, so I always have to like overthink it. <laughs> so I think for some people, this is great. For other people, it makes them go, what's going on? <laughs> Pronunciation. Tap on the table, same thing. Pronunciation. You can do that. Rubber bands. Humming. I know a lot of uh, instructors like to use humming. So by doing humming, you're removing the actual sounds. And sometimes the sounds get in the way. And so you do something like this. I'm going to do technology here I, and just hum it. <laughs> so you're removing the sounds in the words and thereby you're just focusing on the actual stress pattern. So I'll do technology again. 
Let me do pronunciation. <laughs> and so you're noticing I'm just humming. I'm just using kind of my voice without actually putting words in syllables and sounds to interfere. Shall we practice? Okay, here's a word, balloon. Okay, so if we're going to use the, the technique you saw in the video, she's going to use her, her arm like this and she's going to say balloon and stretching her arm as long as it takes. This way you probably won't see me much if I just do it this way, but if I go sideways, you'll probably see better. So balloon. And you notice I really have that long length on that second syllable. Balloon. Balloon. Try another one. This is a three syllable word, right? You have an O, an A, and another O. Uh, well, actually, it's not an O in the first syllable. It's an U, uh, right? U, uh, A, and O. So if I hum it, let me hum it for you first. Here, I'm just going to hum it. No gestures. I'm just going to say, hmm, hmm, hmm. Mm -hmm. So you guys can do that yourself as well. I can't see you, so I don't know if you're doing it. But uh, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> or we can do it with our gestures again. We can do um, potato. Wait, see, this, this blows my mind. But for a lot of people, I know it works. Potato. Potato. See, you can see we're not all kinesthetic learners. I'm not. Um, I do better with the rubber band, actually. Potato. Potato. And the very fact that I am not kinesthetic, which probably means I'm better with auditory, I'm better with visual, but there are students that are going to be better with kinesthetic. They're going to do much better with movement and gestures and humming and rubber bands and all these things they can touch and move. So you want to make sure that we're in integrating activities that can reach everybody, not just, you know, the people who are visual or the people who are kinesthetic or auditory. Do them all and do it in different ways, in multiple ways, and get as many different senses involved as possible. All right. Volunteer. Let me go, go back to my, well, I'm going to hum first. Let me hum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Third syllable, right? Volunteer, volunteer, or volunteer, volunteer. All right. Well, so, I, oh, oh, Dr. Singh. Did, can you try it again, Dr. Singh? Volunteer. Awesome. Beautiful. Got it. Perfect. Okay. And our last one. Oh, this is a long one. Let's see. Op opportunity. Opportunity. Or rubber band. Opportunity. Or we can clap. Opportunity. opportunity. So many people. Opportunity. Awesome. Okay. Nice pronunciation. Perfect. All right. So that is our word stress. Um, I, similar to the prior video, here's another little video and I was looking about where to cut it and it's like, I like it so much. I think we're going to watch the whole thing. It's only three minutes and 20 seconds. This is an app. Okay. So it is called Blue Canoe and it is by the same lady that you saw in the prior, prior video, Karen Taylor. Gina, do you know Karen? Have you? No. Well, you don't. Okay. So she, she's at a lot of conferences, TESOL conferences and such. She would be an excellent person to, to do a workshop. Yeah, yes. she would. I'll have to contact her. She would very much be an excellent person. So Blue Canoe is a, well, I will just play the video instead of, but I like it very much. It has a free version that is free indefinitely, and it has a premium version that has more words and more games and more things also. Um, and it is also, I know they give it away free for classrooms, and I think it's, I don't know, they, they've been having some programs where they've been giving it away free in classrooms for a while. So I think that may still be going on based on like the world situation. I think they may still be offering that. So let's go over to this video real quick. We like free. Well, yes, free is good. The, the free version I think has about 200 
base words that it uses in its things, but it's a really good app. So if you really, really like it, um, actually subscribing is good as well. Um, oh, hold on. I need to go over and get the other video. Here we go. Oh my gosh. Hold on one second. Um, it's still defaulting to the other video. So hopefully that's going to fix it. Still telling me open hand. Oh, okay. There it is. It is this one. Okay. I'm not sure if I shared the audio. Yes, I did. Okay. Blue Canoe is the most effective way for non-native English speakers to improve their clarity and confidence in speaking English. The mobile app is built on a proven brain-based methodology used in specially trained classrooms around the world. With its patent-pending speech recognition and machine learning, the app's virtual AI teacher provides learners with immediate targeted feedback that is uniquely effective to reopen the brain's ability to process new language sounds. As babies, we learn the language sounds of our environment through a special part of the brain called Broca's area. After childhood, Broca's area becomes less flexible, making it difficult to recognize new language sounds, which is why listen and repeat is often unsuccessful as a teaching method. The patented color vowel system bypasses Broca's area by engaging the visual, music, and movement parts of our brain. Blue Canoe teaches how to master the two most important parts of spoken English, stress and the key vowel sound of each word, using visual images and musical patterns. It names each vowel sound with a color and object that use that sound. For example, it names the English sound eh, red pepper, and says that incredible is a red pepper word because its key sound is red pepper. Red pepper, incredible. With Blue Canoe's engaging activities and targeted feedback, learners improve their spoken English with just 10 minutes of practice each day. For example, learners will choose a lesson, say a sentence, and get immediate feedback and mini lessons to improve. It must be incredible to see the results of your hard work. You're using the wrong color vowel here. Green tea, instead of Red pepper, eh. Blue Canoe's content is customized using relevant vocabulary and topics for people of all ages. Learners also learn their pronunciation at the word level by playing the card game, Color It Out, where they engage the musical part of their brain by saying words that repeat a single sound. Rose boat, low, rose boat, though. Sorted Out is a game that enables learners to practice, even when they're in a noisy place. As words fall, a player sorts them by their main vowel sound. Higher rounds get more and more challenging. Learners can look up any English word in our pronunciation dictionary for instant and clear help. Red pepper, eh. Recognize. They can watch short videos with valuable tips. Green tea, ear. That's the sound in here. Learners earn points by meeting their daily goal and track their progress in their profile. As their clarity improves, their Blue Canoe pronunciation score will also increase. To learn more about how Blue Canoe can partner with you to help your learners effect. Oops, okay. I'll go ahead and stop that one. I love that app and my students do too. It is, is really, really effective. They, most of my students, the feedback they say is that like, I really like how it listens to me and says, you pronounce the, what was it? The, oh, the green tea sound instead of the red pepper sound. So it very clearly tells them what sound they produced instead of producing the correct one. So they've really, really liked that and, and found that really, really helpful. So excuse me. Uh -huh. uh, which, uh, what, what was the name of that app? It's called Blue Canoe. And canoe mm -hmm. is spelled C-A-N-O-E. I'll put it in the chat. Absolutely. Bluecanoe.com, right? Um, hmm, I think so. I'm not sure. It's, Blue yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's uh -huh. a it's a phone app though. It's on your phone. I, I don't think that it has a web version. So, okay. Ooh, back to the PowerPoint. Let's see. Um, okay, so that was Blue Canoe. So that's a great way to practice both word stress and vowel sounds. Oh, and the idea is 10 minutes a day and everybody can do 10 minutes a day, right? It's pretty easy to do and it's fun and it's game based and it's a, uh, you know, point based. So you get points and different things and students like those. those are, even adults, adults, children, that works for kind of any level. Okay, so we're moving to another idea, another topic. We're going to talk about thought groups. Thought groups are, are important. Basically, the idea of thought groups and pausing are fairly important. And this goes a lot with speech speed. If you speak very fast and do not have enough pausing, it makes it really difficult for your listener to understand. So it's important on your longer sentences to put little pauses in. So the pausing often is as important as the words. If you don't put those pauses in, we kind of get lost. It, your, the brain gets overwhelmed and we're kind of unable to process too much at once. So longer sentences are split into groups when speaking. And you'll notice longer sentences are split into groups in writing as well. We use commas, we use other punctuation to kind of break up sentences. But well, in speaking, we are going to have more breaks than we would have in writing. So our groupings tend to be about four to seven words long. And the, you know, that can change a little bit. We could have a little bit more, a little bit less, but kind of the tendency is to go about four to seven words. So the brain, and then stop. So the brain has just like that little half a second or so to digest what was just said. So we know to pause for periods and commas. And we're going to pause in additional places so we can highlight the most important information. And thought groups can vary from speaker to speaker. And I encourage you guys to watch speeches. Take a look at like TED Talks or graduation speeches or political speeches or, or anybody who's standing up on a stage and presenting and speaking. Those tend to be speakers that have practiced and rehearsed and they are speaking at a slower pace than a lot of normal speech because they want all of their listeners to follow and understand them. So they tend to slow down their speech and pause. And sometimes those pauses can be dramatic. The pause may be for a couple seconds sometimes if they really want you to think. So listen to, to good public speakers. I mean, seriously, good public speakers, not just anybody standing up, but the ones that are known to be good and notice they're pausing. Okay, there aren't specific rules for where to pause, but there are some guidelines. You'll definitely want to pause, well, obviously at commas and periods, but you'll pause in places like where there's an and, a but, a since, because where you're connecting two clauses together is where natural pauses might fall, where you have like a that, a who, a which. So the more you kind of listen and, and are aware of it, the more you kind of develop a feeling for where you might want to pause. Okay, so observation and practice. Okay. Oh, here's a little, um, a little bit of practice here. These are riddles. So riddles, well, I won't even, I'll just ask you. We won't explain what a riddle is. You probably know. Um, so it's kind of like a little joke. They come out at night without being called and are lost in the day without being stolen. What are they? Hmm. Hmm. No. Shall we keep you in suspense? No, we'll give you the answer. <laughs> or shall I read Dr. it again? Singh, do you have a chat? Dr. Dr. Singh or John, do you have a guess? Uh, no, I, I am not finding any solution. Gina, do you no. have an idea? <laughs> the only thing no. I can think of is stars. The stars, you're right. Oh, yay. Hey, you got it. Okay. <laughs> So, so we're kind of like entertaining ourselves here and having fun, but at the same time, you know, I'm going to be repeating that a few times. They come out at night without being called and are lost yeah. in the day 
without being slow. So you like notice where my pauses are. Notice that I'm not reading that super fast because I need to give you time as a listener to really absorb that material and think about it before I move on to the next piece. And so when I'm teaching this and working with, with students, we will actually write in. When we have written material, we're actually going to write in the breaking points. And, and I usually use like a little slash mark or something to say, here's where I'm stopping. Me as a native speaker, this is where I'm going to stop. Somebody else might read that differently. They might read it like this. They come out at night without being called and are lost in the day without being stolen. So different native speakers will speak at different speeds. And it's kind of good to be aware that there's not an exact rule for doing this. Just start getting a feel for it. All right, I'm gonna give you another one. <laughs> All right, Samuel was out for a walk when it started to rain. He did not have an umbrella and he wasn't wearing a hat. His clothes were soaked, yet not a single hair on his head got wet. How could this happen? <laughs> I have to laugh because I know the answer. <laughs> Any guesses? Do you guys have a guess? John? Dr. Singh? Can no, you guess? No, <laughs> no guess? No thoughts. No thoughts? Any ideas? Is he bald? Yeah, I think the person is bald. <laughs> you got it. You got it. <laughs> you got He's, it. Bald. Yeah. He's bald. Okay. <laughs> so you notice all my pausing in there. I paused in a lot of places, right? And a lot of places, there's, there's no written pause. There's no comma there. But I'm like, oh, these are two clauses, right? Samuel was out for a walk. And then it started to rain. Those are like two sentences that can stand alone that were combined with when. So there's a natural pause point because those were truly two sentences that came together. So an obvious pause point. There's a comma after umbrella. That's an obvious pause point, period, pause point. Uh, there's another comma soaked. And then I kind of slowed down that last part just to really emphasize it. His clothes were soaked, yet not a single hair, right? This is my choice as the reader. Not a single hair on his head got wet. Or you can read the whole thing. His clothes were soaked, yet not a single hair on his head got wet. It's quite not quite as effective, actually, without the pausing, if you notice. It's a little more dramatic. When you're telling a story, you want to be more dramatic, and you leave your listener really wanting to know more. So that is thought groups and how they work. So make sure you put in your pausing in your sentences. When people are having trouble understanding, you slow down and pause more. All right follow up. You can have students choose their own favorite riddles from a website or even make them up if they're really creative. Um, bring them to share for the class. Tell their, fan, their friends, their family, everybody tell riddles. Kids love riddles, so this works well for children. Could work with adults too. With adults, this is what I do. I have them mark up their materials. And this is actually from yesterday. I was working with a student. And from his actual work, I, I, changed the, I changed the names to protect the innocent, right? But um, this is what we're working on. Um, we've got some other notations in there, but you'll see the red slashes are where we decided that we're gonna break in this. This is a little introduction. He was talking about his work and what he does. Basically something that he uses often and you know, talking to other people. This is what I do. My team works on this. Um, and kind of, you know, speaking to a little bit about his experience. So we went in and put in some breaking points. My team's mission is to deliver the best connection experience between cars and phones for billions of drivers. Actually, for billions of drivers. My pitch was off there because I was like, I keep going. But OK, that's another subject pitch. When drivers get into a car, it should just work. So again, for adult learners, this is really effective because they're working with their own relevant materials and they're using this as their practice. And I actually record this for them so that they can hear me and not use the visual. The idea is after a while, we want to remove the visuals or they will never get the sound right because they keep relying on their eyes to tell them pronunciation. So you've got to remove the visual after a while. So they are only going with their ears. 
All right. Next, how are we doing? Five. Okay. Contractions, reductions, and linking. I'm lump lumping those kind of all together because, well, we're removing sounds and we're putting things together. It, they're sort of related. They're all slightly different topics, but sort of related. So English often sounds quite different than it looks, as you're probably aware. And we need to train our ears and stop relying on our eyes. So listen as I read some sentences. Which sounds have disappeared? Do you hear individual words or are they all connected? Oops, <laughs> I wasn't supposed to show you that yet. I'm gonna read it for you. I have a picture of it here on my phone. Okay, although I just saw it and you probably did too. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the first one. So you're listening for, like how many words do you detect in here? Does it sound like one word? Does it sound like two or three? Does it sound like a whole bunch of words? And once you look at it, you wanna think which of those sounds disappeared in my speech? I'm on my way. Oh. How many words did you hear? I'm on my way. Four words. Well. Did you really hear four? Or you no, know what I said? I, which of sounds I'm, has... I'm, on, I'm on my way. Well, I should say, where is there any stopping in there? Is there any breaking between the words? I'm on my way. I'm on my way. If, th if you didn't know English, would you say that was one word? Two, three? I'm on my way. Since we know English, we're like, well, that was like four or five words, right? But because we're used to the way it looks. So I'm right there. I contracted the I am and I removed the A, right? The sound that disappeared was the A. I'm instead of I am, I'm. Uh -huh. I'm on, I'm on. Those connected. I'm on. I'm on my, I'm on my, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Everything just kind of linked up nicely and smoothly with the missing sound being the A in, in am. All right, what's my next one here? I'm gonna give you another one. Now that you know what we're doing, now you're listening for what's missing. What are you gonna do tomorrow? What are you gonna do tomorrow? There's a lot missing in that one. There is. If I had to count them, I would say, what are you gonna do tomorrow? I would count four distinct words there if I didn't know English. What are you? What are you? What are you? Gonna. What are you gonna do? Yeah. So what are you? What are you? And you notice what are? What a, what a. Well, we dropped off the R sound definitely in R, right? It's the, the, the actual letter R, R. Uh, what a, what a, what a, yeah, what a, yeah. In U, it's shortened to this uh sound, this kind of indistinct, short, uh, what a, yeah, what a, yeah, what a, yeah. Going what a, yeah. to, right? Going to, we lost the ing, we lost the T and the two, the, the U sound in two shortened to that uh sound again, gonna. So you'll notice there's all these sounds that just kind of disappeared. So it really sounds quite different from the written, the written words here. What are you going to do tomorrow? Dr. Singh, you want to give it a try? Hey. Oh. <laughs> it's difficult, madam. That's okay. Why we practice. the words, no, that is difficult to, for us I to speak. I what think the difficulty doing? is removing the, the visual from it and just relying on your ears. What are you gonna what are you gonna do tomorrow? What what are ya? What are ya? What are ya? What are ya? Yeah, what are you gonna? What are you gonna? What are you gonna do tomorrow? What are you gonna do, do my? <laughs> oh, the, the, the tricky part here, do tomorrow. So 
there there's something in addition our t's in american english will soften so you'll notice the t in what are ya what are ya actually soften yep. to a d sound what what an american speaker would hear as a d sound other speakers from other languages will hear that as an r sound so what a what a what a what a so that that t in what softened and also do da do tomorrow the t in tomorrow also softened do tomorrow so when the t falls between vowel sounds in american english it softens to that flap sound which we consider a d which you may hear and say that sounds like an r in my language one thing i want to ask madam sure in the american english the spelling i think spelling is also changed na mm -hmm. in concern uk english i think yeah british british spelling is a bit different than american and in some way like the word organize we spell with a z they spell with an s color we spell c o l o r they spell o u r so minor minor differences that are very easily um, understandable if you see it in yeah. writing what here in the tomorrow uh, what should be the spelling in the uh, U us uh, for tomorrow this is the same spelling will be same or it will change no. it's no, the no, same spelling is the same but you'll notice that american english will pronounce the t's quite differently than british english the the t's are very firm and crisp in british english they they would say like you know water water is a really common one i hear um non native speakers living in the us they they very often have a really hard time with the word water they ask for water in a restaurant they say the the server did not understand me they could not understand what i was asking for and finally brought me coffee i mean that's and i've heard that more than once because they say i want hot water and the only thing the server understood was hot and eventually they gave up and brought them coffee because americans don't tend to order hot water in a restaurant so it's not a request they're used to hearing so if they heard hot they probably they assumed it was coffee so uh water you'll notice the t is not you know what like a british english what to uh what <laughs> gina you could probably do this better than i can <laughs> what well oh that sound that's aussie what right is that aussie oh, that's, is that, that's that's cockney that's, yeah, that's cockney yeah. <laughs> what uh i'd like to dug a water Okay. Well, that sounds more kind of cockney where they have the glottal stop for the t, but I think in more of a received British received it'd be more like water. 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 Well, a very firm water. Yeah, some water. Exactly. There we go. And American is water. So you'll notice there's quite a difference there. And if British were to say it's it's hot, well, Americans would say it's hot and wet today. Where you notice the t's almost kind of disappeared, hot and wet. They're there very slightly, hot and wet. British would say it's hot. It, no, sorry, it's hot and wet. Very firmly pronounced T's. So that really kind of trips up people. The the T that they it's very noticeable. They ask about it a lot. Like that's not a T. What happened to the T? Oh my gosh, it went away. Silent sometimes, or T's can become silent in words like internet, international, center. and some others but that's fairly common that they become silent so yeah that's a difference between our different dialects of english all right i'm going to move what, on we we got the idea I'm here <laughs> i'm sorry uh, say again uh, one thing i want to i found that when the vowel number of vowel go on to change or repetition of the vowel uh, some word comes then the pronunciation go on to change in most of the cases do did you find that thing the vowel sounds you are you talking about the differences between like let's say british english versus american english and vowel right. pronunciation there is vowel five vowels in a e i u mm -hmm. u right that when more than one vowel come in a single word then the pronunciation go on to change oh i think you you mean you're talking about a written vowel when you see it in writing Okay. Not You're talking anything. about writing. It want to change. Let me take a yes. I think I think he's talking about word stress when there's two syllables in a word that the vowel sound will change. 
Oh, <laughs> are you talking about a word like um, photograph like, versus photographer? Like where the stress yes. shifted and the vowel sound changed? Or are you yes. talking a yeah, oh, okay. Hmm. Trying to think of some more examples of that. Wolf. Yes, wolf. that happens. Who O is coming? Vowel is coming in wolf. W double O L F. You find there is two vowel is coming at the same time. Oh, okay. okay. So no, we're There's talking about something different here. So you're talking about like let's say in the word weight, W A I T. Wait, is that no? Let me think of a better example. Um, here also. So when you have a single vowel sound in a word, it's usually pronounced with a short vowel sound. For yes. for example, cat, C A T. You usually hear that a ah, that kind of shorter, relaxed ah sound. If you were to put an E at the end of that word, C A T E. Yes. The effect of the E at the end of that word is to change that vowel sound and makes it a long A. So it's Kate instead of cat. I think yes. is that that's what you're referring to, right? Yes. The written vowel letters. Yes. So usually when you see two vowel letters written, like let me go back to wait, W-A-I-T, you have an A and an I. Yeah, uh, yes. That is only one pronounced vowel. You see two of them, but it's really only one vowel sound. Mm. And it tends to be our long vowels. Wait, wait. It's that long vowel sound. The, the long vowels are the ones that have the same pronunciation as their letter name. So A, E, I, O, U. Those are yeah. usually spelled with two vowel letters in writing. Yes, more, mainly confusion occurs in these words, which is having more than one vowel. Mm. Which, are you looking at something on this screen? Dr. Singh? Yes, did, did you mean one of, the, one of the words on this screen here? Uh, like should. O oh, you is coming. Oh, you also. O and you so, is coming in you. There are a lot of our most common words, like the really the, the highest frequency words, are exception rules. They don't follow our normal spelling to pronunciation patterns. Like should is really an exception spelling. I mean, should, could, and would all have that same spelling. But usually that, that sound is usually spelled with two O's, like the word book or foot. That's the most typical spelling for that sound you're hearing. So all of these words that have those unusual spellings where the spelling doesn't really represent the pronunciation at all, they need to be basically memorized. They need to be learned as what we call sight words. Like if you're teaching children to read or, or anybody to read really, you teach them the rules of when you see an AI, usually you're gonna pronounce that as A. And if you see an OA, that's usually O like in boat. But then you're also going to give them lists of words that don't follow those patterns that they just need to memorize because there's no way to get to the pronunciation based on that spelling. And unfortunately, those are the most common words in, in English. The, the lesser common words tend to follow the patterns. So actually, that's kind of good because the most common words you're going to be so familiar with that you learn them very quickly and easily. And then the other words that you haven't seen or not familiar with, you can pretty well guess their pronunciation. Does that answer your question? No, that that was my thinking, no? uh, and mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm I'm correct in that sense. There is a pronunciation problem occurs in those mm -hmm. words, which is Definitely. having more than one vowel. Okay, yeah, I would suggest um, if you're kind of really interested in in like the spelling and pronunciation, to look up no, pho is phonics. Okay, is not problem. Mm -hmm. Spelling okay. is okay, but the, during the pronunciation, it okay. go on to change. Okay. Tomorrow is having three O. 
there uh, also the pronunciation going to change and unfortunately all three o's in tomorrow are pronounced different Tama. yes all three of those are pronounced as is the two and do fortunately do have the same pronunciation but they're not what you would expect with an o spelling to and do are what we call sight words. They're the words you just need to learn that they're said with an oo sound rather than an o sound because a single o rarely pronounces, uh, rarely is pronounced oo. I'm thinking like go or no, it's usually pronounced with an, with an o, like actually o rather than oo. And then tomorrow, all three of those o's are pronounced differently. So English spelling is a big old big mess. It really is. And it would be so nice if we could have a spelling reform and kind of clean this up. But I don't really think that's going to be happening ever. So I guess we just have to get by with what we have. Okay. Ooh. Oh, Gina I'm put just, something. I'm just in. typing in some stuff. But just okay. To help him try to All understand. right. Yeah. All right, Let, let's um, let's move on and talk really quick about, um, we're kind of getting, oh yeah, it's almost 5.30. Okay, let me run through a few other things here. Let's talk about contractions really quick. So Americans almost always use contractions when speaking. Um, they're not bad, lazy, or incorrect speech. Um, actually, let me, let me run really quick over to this page. So our contractions are things like saying she's instead of she is, they'll instead of they will, we'd instead of we had, what's, where'd, aren't, doesn't, and all those sorts. So those are just some basic examples of our contractions. Usually we contract be verbs is our uh, other helping verbs like like will or have get contracted. Question words, what, where, who, and nots, anything with not, is typically contracted in spoken English. Now, let me go back really quick here. So I'll, a lot of times I hear, well, my English teacher told me that contractions are bad or lazy or incorrect and I should not use them. So they're confusing writing with speaking. So traditionally in academic writing, you know, when you're writing an essay, when you're writing an article, when you're writing anything that's kind of seen as formal, contractions were seen as not formal speech, not, not good written English. But in speaking, even in formal speaking, the tendency is to use contractions. It helps us to speak more efficiently, to speak quicker and easier. But in formal situations, we will contract less, but we won't eliminate them. So instead of saying, I think of a good example. Um, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Right? You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have, right? Shouldn't have. You shouldn't have done that. So should not have. I contracted quite a bit, shouldn't I? I've removed several different sounds in there. In a more formal setting, I would still contract, but I would not contract as much. Should, shouldn't have, shouldn't have. I would, notice the difference, shouldn't have, shouldn't have, shouldn't have. I would not cut off necessarily the end as I would in more fast, informal, shouldn't have. So there are slight differences in levels of contraction in formal versus informal speech. But if you listen to good public speakers, you will still hear a lot of contractions and reductions in their speech. Even if their speech is very polished and very well enunciated, they will still say gonna and wanna and other I've instead of I have. They'll still use that quite a lot in speech. Right, we talked about that. Okay, so don't ignore contractions for your spoken English. Try to actually use them. And similar to contractions, well, contractions are your, if you notice, your textbook English. You've learned this back in beginning English where we've removed, removed a sound and a written letter and we've written in the apostrophe to show that the sound and letter has been removed. 
So reductions are similar to that, but I used to say they were rarely seen in writing, but really <laughs> language has changed a lot in the last 20 years. And what you never ever saw in writing before, you do see in writing now. You see wanna, if you're watching a TV or a movie, you see wanna written on your screen instead of want to. In song lyrics, you'll, and even some song titles I've seen wanna in there. People text each other and they write wanna instead of want to. So these reductions or other ways of contracting words, removing letters and sounds, well, I would say sounds more so than letters, because letters are written, sounds are spoken. This has become very normal to the fact that it's reached our written language at this point. So gonna is so common that you usually see G-O-N-N-A in, in, again, movies, TV, songs, texting, gonna, have to. And these are just examples, there are some others um, there's not a huge number of these, but I would say there's probably maybe 30 that are really common. And once you know them, your ear gets trained to, to hear these and to understand English better. If you're used to listening for have got to and you hear gotta, there's kind of that disconnect between, you know, your brain's not getting what it just heard. So once you become familiar with this, oh, okay, gotta means have got to, you start to understand things better. Shoulda. Instead of should have, you should have, I should have, I should have left earlier. I shoulda, I shoulda left earlier. No, no speaker will ever say I should have left earlier. It's very choppy and takes a lot of extra effort to say. So I shoulda. A lotta. I have a lot of work to do. Instead of I have a lot of work to do, no native speaker would ever say I have a lot of work to do. It just is far too time consuming and difficult. And this is why so many of the students that I work with, English is so hard for them to speak because they're trying to pronounce all the sounds that we natives have eliminated because they're too hard to pronounce. A lot of, instead of a lot of, it's just is kind of tiring to pronounce all those sounds. Okay. So those are reductions and there are others. I'm gonna skip that one. Linking, let's talk about linking a little, little bit. So within our thought groups, we're going to connect the end of one word to the beginning of, of the next for kind of that smooth, fluent sound. No pausing, there are pausing between certain sounds, but a good deal of those sounds combine nicely together and just gives you that really nice fluid sound to your speech. And again, that connection makes your speech much more efficient. It's easier to talk with less, less effort. And you'll also notice, especially we drop sounds to connect things nicely. So that is what most non-native speakers aren't aware of. We remove sounds that are too hard to say so we can easily connect our words. So it's making our speech more efficient. And once you learn to do that, English becomes easier to actually speak. All right, so for my adult students, I have them again mark up their text a lot of times so they can very clearly predict. We're going to predict, we're going to anticipate what is going to link before we actually say it. So we're going to say, okay, the, the Z sound in is, is is written with an S, but you hear a Z, is, is going to nicely blend in with is it, is it. Okay, still raining, the L and the R will combine nicely there, still raining, raining out. So I have all these little markers, C to V is consonant to vowel linking, CV, CC is consonant to consonant linking. So you'll see the C's and the V's, C's are consonants, V's are vowels. Make a little note there saying these are gonna blend. I have some other notations on there as well, but the C's and the V's are where we're all linking things. Okay, so yeah, so marking up, kind of gives that awareness and we're playing with it. But then after a while, we're going to remove the visuals. After, after we've gotten used to and are aware of what's happening, we're gonna get rid of the visuals and start working with our ears of listening for it and actually repeating. But at the beginning, your, your older, your teenage and adult ears are not tuned in to hear that. They need to become aware and they need to see it and 
then we can take away the visual and say, okay, now listen for it. But really all those visuals really do get in the way in the long run. So that you need to take away, take away, we'd say the crutches after a while, take away the supports and, you know, start saying now listen for what we just talked about. Okay. Oh, singing. Okay. So with the adults, we like to do our markups here and play with that. And, but what are we gonna do with our kids? Singing is great for kids and adults. And studies show that singing is really effective in improving pronunciation, pronunciation in an enjoyable way. So basically, you're not thinking about it. As long as you like the song, you're just going to have a good time. As long as you're not focused on your singing voice or anything, which adults tend to be a little over-focused on. I can't sing. It's embarrassing. So, which obviously you don't need to sing for other people. But the thought is, like, if you're driving in your car, you can sing for yourself. Nobody, nobody will hear you. Maybe if you're in your shower, you can sing for yourself. Uh, maybe if you're home alone, if you're walking in the woods on the beach, wherever you can sing, hope, well, maybe. Um, don't be shy. A lot of my adult students are shy to sing, but I don't know. I think it works wonders for, for pronunciation and you don't really even need to think about it. Excellent for whole language. And you can also give your songs a specific focus. You can focus on specific super segmental um, items. You can also focus on specific sounds if you want. I'll give you a few examples here in a second. Um, so you'll want to find songs that are easy, but that you love. So things that are slow enough that you can easily hear the words. Some songs are just mumbled and difficult to understand the words where the native speakers can't understand the words. So not ideal for practicing. So again, you can analyze the song before singing if you want, and you want to specifically focus on a certain element of pronunciation, but you don't have to. You can focus on linking reductions, contractions, and actually analyze and mark if you want. You can focus on a certain sound that's repeated a lot in a song if you want, you don't have to. The idea is to match the singer's intonation patterns exactly. So you want to match their linking, their reductions. You want to match their speed, which means that you need to include your reductions, contractions, and linking, and actually pause in the same places, go up where they go up, down where they go down, basically match them as if you were the singer. So here are some that I've used before with students. The song Home by Philip Phillips has a lot of L sounds in there. Lots and lots and lots. And L can be really difficult for, for a lot of people, especially the ending L's. Okay, that those dark L's and syllabic L's at the ends are really tricky. Uh, the song Daylight by Maroon 5 is really good. It's, you know, linking reduction contractions. It's got all kinds of things that you can um, notice in there. And then this one, look at the title of this song. The title is what do you, what do you want from me? Right in the title says it all. And it's fairly easy to understand. And both Maroon 5 and Adam Lambert are fairly, uh, fairly popular with young people. And mm, yeah, obviously you want to watch out some of your songs, make sure they don't have, you know, lyrics that are, you know, offensive in any way, but uh, you know, take a look at those earlier. <laughs> But anyhow, these are great with younger learners because they know they know the artist, they know the group, they're familiar with it and, and, you know, kind of motivates them a bit more than something, you know, the Beatles or something, which they're going, oh, God, not that again. Um, I don't know why the teachers keep resurrecting the Beatles over and over again. It's like, yeah, that's kind of, you know, what are we like 60 years back now? So... <laughs> Not that you can never use those, but they're kind of overused, I think, in, in classrooms. Okay, um, encourage students to sing every day with their favorite songs. We, again, we want to open our brain, open the music, <laughs> I can't even talk, the musicality and rhythmic part of your brain, open that part, it's different than the language area of the brain, and you will see wonders in pronunciation. Karaoke apps work well also. I know there's some of those out there as well. There used to be a really good one that was like karaoke um, competitions, but it kind of disappeared. I think Gina used that one as well, right? In China. And then it just disappeared. And I don't know, I think it lost its rights to the songs or something, but that was excellent. They'd have competitions and all kinds of stuff. 
but I know there's still some apps out there that you can um, use the apps. It's okay. I like lyrics training. Lyrics training? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that one. I, I don't know if you, have you tried it? I have not tried it. I'll write that one down myself. Lyrics oh, training. Put it, I'm going to put it in the chat. Okay, that's good. Oh. It's really good that, you know, as educators too, that we share the resources that we've found that have been helpful for our students. Because I know I learn stuff from, you know, all the time when I talk to other teachers, I'm using this one, I'm using that one. And so even my students have come up and told me this app is really good. And I'm like, oh, great. So it's great to share with other people and, and we can compile a nice list of things that are that are working well. And inexpensive yeah, it has or like free. competitions in it where you can you have to guess what word is missing in the song like oh. and you can compete with your friends and then also has a karaoke version where you can just sing along nice perfect all right let's see oh here we go um how are we doing on time oh we're not too bad movie scene dubbing this is kind of fun because a lot of times i like to use pop culture movies songs things that um people are motivated motivated by kind of you know pop culture these days their movies it's tv their songs there are all these things that are around them and relevant if they're if it's their favorite uh, tv show and you have a scene from there they're like hey i want to do this i want to be you know sheldon cooper you know and you know they they you know can decide who's who and so so for dubbing basically you're doing the voice over you are doing the voice over for your TV scene or your movie scene. Um, I would say you, you need to be really, really familiar with the dialogue. So you need to do the, a clip and make it like a small clip, like you know, like a two minute clip or something. And you have to be super familiar with the dialogue and to the point where you've learned the dialogue and can do it. So basically this is karaoke, but with like TV or movies, you're doing the voice. Okay. So once you get to the point where they all know the dialogue, you have the captions on with no sound. And so your students are acting out the, the characters. So I have not tried that in a classroom because, well, why haven't I tried that in a classroom? Well, I haven't had young learners for a while. Since I've been doing adults for the last several years, I haven't had any young, um, you know, younger people. And I like it with my adults. We do where they have to, I tell them they pick a, pick their favorite person, like anyone that they want. Mm -hmm. And then they have to come to class with a, um, at least 30 seconds of that person's voice that they oh. practice and try to mimic them. It's kind of fun to see the, like, oh, that's awesome. In, yeah. They come in and they're Brad Pitt or they're, um, oh, you know, nice. Jennifer Aniston or something. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's pretty funny. <laughs> are they, are they, are you guessing who they are based on their performance or? Um, or, sometimes we try, but most of the time we just, um, we just, uh, compare, like they, they show the clips that they used and then oh, we compare okay. how well they mimic them. Yeah. Nice. That's fun. Okay. Uh, oh yeah. Present for the class vote of the most accurate. That's just one version of this. Um, you can also use clips for just awareness for this one. This one is hysterical. Actually, Shel Sheldon, if you know the big bang theory at all, Sheldon wears flip flops. So it is a whole story of I did this and this happened and blah, blah, blah. So it's all full of these ED endings and past tense verbs. So the idea is, well, they could potentially note down the past tense verbs, but I would actually give them the list and say, listen to the pronunciation and categorize these. Which verbs did you hear were pronounced with a D, which had ones had a T, which one sounded like, you know, like walked, walked, which had a T ending, which had a D ending, like called, or which had a full ED ending, like decided, and have them categorize the three categories, like which ones, how were the ED endings pronounced? So it's actually putting this kind of dry, it's not exactly grammar, but kind of the, oh, I have to memorize the endings are different into a, oh, I heard called, I heard talked, I heard walked, I heard decided, I heard waited. Well, not waited, waited. <laughs> I should pronounce in American English, right? Waited. So it gets their ears tuned into hearing, hearing that, basically for awareness. All right. 
Uh, I have one other app that I wanted to recognize. It's called Elsa Speak. It's a pronunciation app as well. I'm not going to run through all the videos and all. It's in a way similar to Blue Canoe, but um, it also has like consonant sound. Blue Canoe just deals with vowel sounds in word stress. Elsa Speak is more kind of like the whole sentence and it, and it also has got the consonants in there and it'll tell you, you, you mispronounce this and that. So this one is also based on artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. So, so this one's pretty cool too. The nice thing about Blue Canoe is Blue Canoe has a free version that you can use indefinitely. Elsa Speak has no free version. Um, it has, I think, a seven or 14 day trial, and then you need to buy it if you like it. So I do have a coupon code for that. If you put my name in there, you get a 20% discount. But um, if you really like it, you can subscribe to it and buy it. But there is no free version of this one. So that's why. But it's a cool one. My students like this one as well. So you might want to try it out. And, and if you have the budget, it's, it's not terribly expensive, but I know for people in other countries, it might be a little bit beyond their, their, uh, their ability to pay, but you might check it out if you, if you're interested. And I think we're at the end. We are at the end. So after this workshop, hopefully you understand some of the concepts of rhythm and melody of your supra segmentals to use that word again supra segmentals we talked about word stress and thought groups contractions reductions and linking there are more elements of rhythm and melody that we didn't talk about just for lack of time we could talk about sentence stress we could talk about voice quality we could talk about other things as well pitch but uh for another time so, and you also have some basic activities that you can use either in your own improvement or also with your students if you are a teacher as well. So, hopefully you learned something. What was the most useful thing you learned from this presentation? Tell us what you learned, guys. <laughs> Pronunciation. Pronunciation, yes. Hopefully you learned some specifics that you can also apply and uh, and improve on. Yeah, I look, got a lot of activities that I want to try with my students. So thank you for good. all of the useful tips. Well, good. Yeah, I had to pull out several of them that were in person stuff. I'm like, darn it, I love that game. I, you know, I have a, a lot of games to play that I've actually used in my class. Oh my goodness. Is, have you seen the fly swatter one? Oh, yeah, that's a lot of fun. I've played that before. Actually, I have, yeah, come to think of it, I have played that not too long ago and the students were like there was one that like fell on the floor she's running up there boom and like she like falls on the floor and I'm thinking oh my god I hope I didn't get us have a student get hurt in the classroom <laughs> and they're laughing hysterically and having a great old time with that one so oh well but there are plenty of good things that we can do still online as well and with apps and and, and other fun things but one of these days we'll get back and play fly swatter game again <laughs> and some other fun things in person. All right. John, what did you learn? Let's, let's see if John will tell us what he learned. He may not have probably audio access, but he might be able to type. I put it, I, I asked him the question in the chat. Yeah, I've, I've been chatting with him um, a little bit. Oh, he to has actually make, written in the make chat. Make sure he's still here. Yeah, he is there. Okay, yeah, so, awesome. Yeah. Well, good, so John. I'm glad that chat. you're here. Okay, <laughs> I'm glad that you've stuck like, around for the it. for the whole presentation as well. So, but he hasn't replied yet. Okay. <laughs> well, this is the moment for you to think of what did I learn? What did I learn before you forget? Because as soon as we uh, we tune out, then we're like we forget it all. Unless we make, you know, a real note to I'm going to use this. This was really cool. I'm going to check this app out. I'm going to, uh, you know, practice this specific thing on my own. You know, take your little notes. So I've been taking notes. <laughs> well, Gina, what did you, what was the most useful thing you've learned from the presentation? Um, well, the, what I, I wrote down was the youglish.com. And uh -huh. I also wrote down about the, the Sheldon Wears flip-flops. I, I am always 
um, uh, <laughs> trying to find interesting ways to teach those um, ED pronunciations. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that I, I jotted down that I want to use with my students. Cool. 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 Oh, that one is funny. Oops. Big Bang is, um, in a lot of the instances, I don't think it's the best TV show to actually learn English with, because if you're familiar with the show, sometimes the language is a bit um, non-typical, right? So it's not always the easiest one. There are, there are definitely better shows for just regular banter and, you know, conversation. But that one, it's funny and people, you know, like it because of the humor. But uh, I think a lot of the language kind of goes beyond people. Yeah, it seems to be this generation's um, friends. Like our, our generation had friends and Big Bang Theory seems to be the, the newest one. Yeah, you know, uh, still I hear very frequently people are like, I love to watch Friends and I'm thinking, really? That's like, like 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, but it's still know. funny. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. But uh, that's true. That's true. All right. Let's see uh, about my YouTube channel. So I've got a ton of videos. I think about 130 at this point. So I have videos on a lot of the things we talked about today. I have videos on word stress, on thought groups, on reductions and linking and all those kinds of things. I have a couple that are called smooth English. So it's kind of, as you can see on the screen there, how's it going? I have to go to. It's a lot of the the mix of we're linking, but we're also reducing and using contractions and kind of that almost super common expressions that have become almost formulas for a native speaker. How's it going? We never would think in our head, how is it going? We would never even imagine that those are four words. The native speaker is just going to say, how's it going? Right. It's become kind of a formula because it's so commonly said. I have to, I have to go to school. I have to go to work. I have to go to the bathroom. I have to go to whatever. It becomes just so, so natural to us that we would never separate those into its components. And so kind of the more that you can practice and get used to those kind of speech formulas, you know, you're, you're sounding more native that way rather than chopping up everything into its individual words. <laughs> it sounds very choppy. So, yeah, so that's a, that's a good video as well as all the other ones. Um, I listed the intonation playlist and we can send you these links afterwards as well. Um, the intonation playlist has, you know, all the topics kind of from today. Um, other playlists have vowel sounds, like lots of different vowel sounds. There's consonant sounds. There's, oh my goodness. Uh, I've got some number videos. I've got some small talk videos, a variety of different things. So. Um, so check out the YouTube channel and feel free to use it in your classes too. All, all the videos there are Creative Commons licensed, so you can use them in your classrooms and you can use them for yourself too. So I think that's all I've got there. You can find me at English with Accent Coach Nicole or just look up Accent Coach Nicole if you don't have the link. Yay. And then I'm also on LinkedIn and Facebook and those different things too. So Another thing, John has said that he learned a lot. He put it in the chat and that he likes to practice with Cambridge English. Okay. And practice yeah. in what way? Um, I think there's a website that he uses. I, right used, I use the Cambridge Learner's Dictionary a lot. Uh, being that it's a learner's dictionary, it's got, well, it's definitely got the pronunciation where you can see it written in phonetic symbols. You can hear it in both American and British. And it has things listed like collocations and lots of examples. And Cambridge Dictionary is one of the better ones that I, I do consult a lot. So yeah. I don't know Cambridge if, I mean, I know they have textbooks and other things as well. I'm not, he's, he didn't mention it. He says, um, I always practice with Cambridge. Maybe, uh, John, are you talking about the, um, the webs, the um, dictionary? Oh. Oh, maybe perhaps there's a, an interactive website as well. There are so many materials out there these days. It's hard to keep up really. Things come out constantly. Yeah. Hopefully he'll clarify in a, in a chat in a second, but yeah. Okay. 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 Um, well, great. Thank you so much, Nicole. This has been fabulous. I, um, and I hope that, um, our participants uh, learned a lot as well as um, 
the people who are watching on YouTube live right now. Um, so yeah, hopefully they learned a lot. I wanted to, before we go, I wanted to make sure that people know about the upcoming workshops that we have. And so um, I'm going to share that with you very quickly before we go. We have the next oh, one. Beth Trudell, I've done, yeah. um, I've, uh, she's done teacher training for us before when we were in China. Oh. I don't, were yeah, you that's where I, Yeah, that's where okay. I met her the first time. But yeah, mm -hmm. she did, um, she did an interview, I interviewed her, I think the week after yours was, was oh. Beth's um, interview. Okay. Yeah, and so she's got a workshop coming up. The, the next mm -hmm. one coming up is with another former fellow. He was a fellow in Ethiopia, and he's got, going to be talking about enhancing student learning in multi-level classes. And so he'll be um, presenting at 11 a.m. GMT um, on December 2nd. And then Beth is coming up, and I've adjusted the time because both of you, you and Beth, I... Um, I interviewed you before daylight savings time had changed. So the, oh. the time changed. So that was kind of the, oh the issue goodness. we had today. So I changed it instead of, I tried changing it to the correct time, but that was going to be midnight, which then confuses mm -hmm. everyone. The date right. Thing. Exactly. So I changed it to 1155. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to start almost at midnight um, GMT, but at 4 PM for her. So the same time as yours. But yeah, so I adjusted the time so we don't have the same confusion that we had with yours today. Exactly. Um, okay. But yeah, so she's she's going to be presenting that on December 4th. And then we have Armin is going to be teaching us about how to use Padlets on the 5th at 2 p.m. GMT. And then Laura Connor, you remember Laura? No. She's in Mongolia. She's in Mongolia. Maybe oh. she's... Maybe oh, she's, I, I see Maybe Kelly. she was there the I first year. Yeah. picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think um, maybe we went to, I think she was in Mongolia the year before you arrived in China. Okay. So, um, yeah, so she's, uh, she was a fellow in Mongolia, and she's going to be talking a lot about vocabulary and how to teach vocabulary with your students. And so lots of, lots oh. more things like, um, than, than this. And then a friend of mine in LA is going to be teaching us um, about how to start an English club. Or if you're in the States, how to start an ESL club with your students. And so she's going to talk about how she and her colleagues started their club in, um, in LA. All right. And then um, I always like to plug these. This, um, these two um, uh, teachers interviewed me on their podcast. So if you haven't oh. listened to Inspiring Educators or Armin's English Language Fellow podcast, um, you can find my interviews there. Or listen to their other. Mine episodes. too. <laughs> oh, oh, Armin right. also interviewed me. Yeah, interviewed yeah. you too. I think the week before you actually. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, was the I one who actually. suggested you. I told him to to talk to you. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's um, <clears throat> yeah. Your interview was really good. I listened to that. That was cool. Cool. Thanks. And then um, yes, yeah, so, uh, just thank you guys who are participating in these workshops and telling your friends and spreading the word about TTLT. That's pretty awesome. And, um, and now um, TTLT is funded by a nonprofit. So we're now officially a nonprofit. So Yay. if you want to donate to TTLT, it's a tax deduction. Yay. Yay. All right. Hmm. Okay. So this is, these are all the places that you can find TTLT. If you are wanting to learn more, to, to watch our podcast, listen to, um, or watch, listen to our podcast and watch our videos and join our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter and Instagram. So there's lots of different ways that you can find TTLT and stay informed about what's happening. And on the website, there's a workshop page so you can see the latest workshop schedule. So you can see what's happening on TTLT. Dr. So, Singh would like the, the